As the massacres continued in government-controlled areas, children of mixed ethnicity families born to Tutsi fathers were rounded up and put into a home guarded by Inerame militia only to be massacred on 8th June 1994. Mothers who tried to protect their children were also killed. Today's episode also describes meetings held between 9th to 10th June 1994 attended by top government officials discussing exactly what was necessary to expedite the killings of surviving Tutsis across the country. On Friday 10th June 1994, Inerangwe militia burst into St. Charles Gwanga Catholic Parish in Yamirambo under the guise of evacuating orphans. Instead, 400 Tutsi refugees were murdered at the parish, many of them children. June 8, 1994. Massacres of children born from Hutu women and Tutsi men in Kavumu, Ngororero. The genocide at Kavumu was carried out with the greatest magnitude. Kavumu was one of the sectors in Ramba Commune in Giseni Prefecture and is one of the areas that were mostly populated by Tutsis in Giseni. The history of Kavumu shows that it is an area that had been plagued by violence and killings of Tutsis since 1959, some of whom fled and others experienced destitute living conditions. The 1994 genocide against the Tutsis claimed the lives of almost all the Tutsis in the area. Some were killed in churches and the buildings of Ramba and Gaseche communes. The massacres of Tutsis and the brutality of the genocide is evidenced by the fact that 24,188 bodies were decently laid to rest in the Kavumo Memorial. There are also bodies dumped in various unknown locations and are yet to be found despite the fact that genocide occurred in the broad daylight. For instance, the bodies of Kamanzi and Viraro were found 24 years later. In April 1994, Ramba commune was ruled by Burgumestre Karasira Leonar, who was a member of the MRND party. Karasira collaborated with Bazimaziti Bernardin, the sous-préfet of Ngorero sous-préfecture, which brought together Satinsi, Ramba and Chibira communes. The Inerangwe militia were the most prominent in the massacres, and there were many in Gorero. They collaborated with Musa Migambi of the CDR and used to wear uniforms while going to kill Tutsis. Among the Tutsis killed were the families of Kabiriji, killed by their neighbors, the family of Minama, the family of Munyakayanza Isidor, who was a teacher, Niemira Leonard and his family, the family of Kagaragu, Mudahangargwa, Gatsimbanyi, Rutaisire, Seba Garamba, Wirinji Imana, Shimi Imana, Nsenji Yumva, Nyamujira, Ndamaje, Kaitsinga, Zanimwano, Gatari, Nyiraromba, Bokamba, Wonghunda no Siata, Kamirindi, Furera and his children, Kaibanda, Mathieu, Murenjira Ndungwari, and others. Twenty others from the family of Dati Vuamngiza were first buried in the cemetery near Mukorar Gwabujiri, but in 2018, their bodies were exhumed to be laid to rest at Chibiria Memorial. The Kavumu Memorial is a final resting place for the bodies of 374 Tutsis, but not only them were killed there. Others have been buried in other memorials, either in Ngororero, Kabaya, or Chibirira. The Inerangwe militia and Imuza Mugambi collaborated in all the massacres in Ramba, especially in the Sovu and Wai sectors, and were led by Barakomera, but supported by those from Gaseche and Satinsi communes. Most of the Inherangwe militia were from Ngorero and they were led by Kavirida Teresfor, a school inspector who also headed the Inherangwe militia in Satinsi commune, and his wife, Mukaruziga Ejeni, who was the vice president of CDR in Satinsi, and this is where Ngorero sous prefecture headquarters was located. Barushimana Bonaventure, a former businessman and former MRD president in the Muchano sector, played a key role in the massacres of Tutsis in various parts of the country as he had given his car to transport Inerahamge militia and Musa Migambi to kill. Another major Inerahamge who actively participated in the genocide perpetrated in Gorodero was Nyan Bijan Claude, who was a teacher at Kavumu Primary School in Ramba Commune. In the Rwandan culture referred to in 1994, a child took the father's ethnic group and was recorded in the identity card of an individual. This meant that when a Tutsi man married a Hutu woman, their child were of the Tutsi ethnic group. When a Hutu man married a Tutsi woman, 
their children would be given Hutu ethnic group in their identity cards. As a result, during the genocide, children born to Tutsi men and Hutu women were treated as Tutsis and even killed in the same way as Tutsis from the bloodline of their fathers. On June 8, 1994, the Ineramwe militia of MRND in collaboration with Musa Migambi of CDR, who had already massacred Tutsis, including many men who had married Hutu women, also demolished their homes. The Ineramwe militia killed the Tutsis in early April 1994. They took the killed children of Tutsi men who had married Hutu women and put them in the same houses and ordered their mothers to guard them. But in order to ensure that those women would not escape, they left few Nerame militia to control them. There were 13 children, including infants. On June 8, 1994, the Inirhamwe came to kill the children and their mothers, and only one child survived. They were cruelly killed. Some of them were thrown alive in a pit they had excavated, and their Hutu mothers were ordered by Inirhamwe militia to return home. The diary of Eduard Karimera, the Minister of Local Government of June 9, 1994, shows that on that day a cabinet meeting was convened to assess the use of 50 million Rwandan francs, which had been handed out by the government in the context of implementing the instructions of the Prime Minister Jacques Ambanda on May 25, 1994, on the expedition of the genocide. In order to continue supporting the auto defense civil program, the cabinet meeting held on June 9, 1994, called on the National Bank BNR to consider how the account number 120.12.33 allocated to receive the support from the Minister of Planning, Miniplan, would do well. BNR was also provided with specimens indicating the signatories for the account. The Cabinet meeting of June 9, 1994, also reviewed the progress of Auto Defense Civil Program and found that there was a need for improvement in order for the genocide to be carried out everywhere and expeditiously. The first thing was to prepare a long report to be submitted to the Prime Minister outlining the implementation of the program across the country. It was mentioned that in some places, people have not responded well to the auto defense civil program and necessitated that the soldiers take the lead in showing people how to find the enemy and fight them. This meant that soldiers were required to show the public how the killings of Tutsis should proceed and prepare a report explaining the cause of the massacres. The second item on the agenda of the government was to conduct a census of young men who received both the training and weapons in the auto defense civil program in each commune and to report it to the prefect and discuss it with the military commanders in the prefecture so that errors could be rectified and the genocide could be spread across the country. The third resolution adopted by the Kambanda government was to mobilize all levels to intensify the campaign through especially the media and community outreach meetings to mobilize them for joining hands to fight the enemy everywhere. That meant people should be encouraged to continue searching for Tutsis who are still alive rather than rushing to flee only. The meeting decided to appoint a permanent staff member in the Ministry of Local Government in charge of preparing daily publications available to the media and local authorities to assist them in the campaign. The assignment was given to Nico Faustin, who was formerly a sous-prefet of Jimba Prefecture. The cabinet also agreed that the Prime Minister should write to the Commander-in-Chief of the Rwandan Armed Forces and ask him to instruct the army leaders so that the military would show people how to pinpoint the enemy and provide them with necessary equipment and advice to make the operation a success. According to Nyiramasuhuko's diary, on June 10, 1994, a government meeting was held to review a number of issues, but the recurring issue was related to the way in which the genocide was carried out. Nyiramasuhuko wrote on a review of how auto defense civil should be expedited across the country. It was agreed that in order to obtain sufficient firearms, each trader was required to purchase at least two firearms, one belonging to him or herself and the other to the neighbors in the area where the trader lived. It was also decided that these guns are distributed in schools so that each school has 10 guns. The meeting also pointed out that there is a need to put more effort into auto defense civil in Giseni Prefecture because it was not carried out to the desired level. However, they were happy with how it was being carried out in Butare Prefecture and hence an extra 2 million Rwandan francs was given to Butare to continue the program. This means that the government provided money to commit killings and monitored it. 
Among the considerations of the June 10, 1994 cabinet meeting was how guns should continue to be distributed to the public, especially among the Nyiramwe militia. According to Nyiramasuko's notes in her diary, they were pleased with the successful operations in Nuririndo, and the chief of the army in that region was applauded. In addition, the collaboration between the Rushashi sous-préfet in Kigaringai and the one for Tiyumba and Jitarama in the auto Defense Civil Program was applauded and requested that such examples should be followed by others. In Ruhenjiri, Lieutenant Colonel Marcel Bifugabagabo, who was in charge of the auto Defense Civil Operation, was praised as he had managed to distribute 120 guns in Chiniji Commune in Ruhenjiri. However, there were concerns that the military leadership in Butare was disorderly. The decision to tighten arms distribution was also reflected in the diary of Jirabatkwari Ogista. The former Minister of Planning, who wrote that auto Defense Civil in Jitarama, Jisenyi, and Ruhenjiri was being carried out in a pleasant manner. Jirabatkwari added that 50 million Rwandan francs for the entire program throughout the country should be immediately disbursed. This was an additional budget for the auto Defense Civil, which had been approved by the cabinet meeting of June 9, 1994. Jirema Suhuko also wrote that the government was pleased that all citizens had already understood that they were required in the auto Defense Civil program, stating that they had all owned the program and were participating properly. This meant that Kambanda's government was proud that the genocide was achieving its goals for extermination of Tutsis throughout the country. It was agreed that the village leaders and the Burgumers would be given a reward for their good work. However, the government was disappointed that Lohat Kwajira Yezu, Burgumester of Butama Commune, and members of MDR party had fled and that they had found 80 guns in his office not distributed. The guns were immediately handed over to Inerame militia to use them in the massacres of Tutsis. Although Kambanda's government members were pleased at the meeting that the genocide was being carried out properly, there were some areas of improvement. Niramasuko wrote in her diary, that there was a problem of many Hutus in Chibuye who supported the RPF in Otani Manifesto because Seth Senda Shonga was born from Chibuye. Rugamatami Komin was headed by Rugumestra Aber Furer, a brother to Seth Senda Shonga, who was given as an example. Jirabatkwari's diary also reflected on the same issue that had been debated, but he had written fewer notes compared to Njiramasuhuko. Jirabatkwari wrote that the RPF had infiltrated in Chibuye and got Hutu members. However, Frere Abel committed the genocide despite the government claiming that being a brother of Seth Senda Shonga will not permit him to do so. Guamatami Commune was one of the forefront of the genocide even since 1992. It was one of the areas in which the killings of Tutsis in Chibuye were started, as well as in the nearby Jishita Commune. The government also invented a false statement that was discussed at the June 10, 1994 meeting that Inyenzi had arrived in Visesero. This was written in Yiramasuko's diary. As it turned out in the days following the June 1994, the lie that the Waingotani in Visesero was an excuse to find a way to send troops to exterminate the remaining Tutsis in Visesero Hills. Worse still, the government concluded that Tutsis in Visesero should be killed. But at the June 10, 1994 meeting, it was decided that the radio antenna on Mount Karonji should be protected. This meant that the antenna was more valuable than the lives of Tutsis. A witness called Double X for security reasons, who was a former member of Kambanda's government, testified at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, ICTR. He said that at a government meeting on June 10, 1994, he was surprised to hear that the Minister of Defense, Augustin Vizimana, had demanded the killings of Tutsi bishops. The witness testified that in his speech, Minister Vizimana explained that his request was in line with the wishes of the military leaders who had demanded that two Tutsi Catholic bishops, Bishop Gahamani Jean Baptiste and Bishop Karibushi Wazislas, be killed in retaliation for three other bishops, Bishop Tade Senjiumva, Bishop Vincent Senjiumva, and Bishop Joseph Ruzindana, who had been shot dead by RPF soldiers on June 5, 1994, in Kabgai. Witness Double X said he was shocked that the idea of such a murder was being considered at a cabinet meeting and was given enough time, and he said that he had opposed it. He also explained that the meeting ended with no decision on the matter, as Kambanda had quickly concluded the meeting telling them that he was going to the funeral of Protez Janirezo's mother, and that they should postpone the matter for the next meeting. According to Witness Double X, ministers who were presented at the meeting were 
Mugenzi Justin, Prosper Mugiraneza, Pauline Nyiramasuko, Edward Karemera and Augustin Jirabatkwari. He further explained that there were times when some ministers did not attend the cabinet meeting because they were involved in the campaign in the assigned prefectures to mobilize Hutus to accelerate the genocide. Bishop Karibushi, who was part of the bishops to be killed, was not a Tutsi, but a Hutu from Jimana. He was not an extremist, but a truthful person who fought hard for the Tutsi both during the genocide and before the genocide. During the genocide, Niniramwe militia tried to kill him many times. On June 10th, 1994, the Ineramwe militia murdered more than 400 people, mainly children, who were taken refuge at St. Charles Gwanga Catholic Parish of Nyamirambo. On Friday, June 10th, 1994, the Ineramwe militia burst into the parish saying that they were going to evacuate orphans. They were commanded by Tijinji, who was one of their leaders. Father Henry Blanca, a Frenchman, and Father Otto Mayer, a German, refused to open the doors of the building. The Ineramwe militia attacked him with an axe and threw grenades. Then they put the hostages in a truck. The truck did several round trips until all the tutus were hidden in the parish were found. Father Otto Mayer sought help from the College Saint André near the parish where soldiers of the government were staying. He was stopped at a roadblock where the Ineramwe militia ordered him to turn back. On a second attempt, a government official gave him permission to cross the roadblock. A little farther, he saw the truck which had taken Tutsi hostages. There were corpses on the ground and in the truck. The priest recognized some of them because they were his parish members. The majority of the victims were children. Jean Chatier of the French daily newspaper L'Humanité reported these horrible massacres in the issue of L'Humanité of June 13, 1994, citing the figure of 170 people according to the priests. The survivors of these massacres noted that there were more than 400 Tutsis who were kidnapped from the parish of saint charles le gwanga on Friday, June 10, 1994, and then killed by Niramwe militia. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Quivoka Podcast. As always, make sure you leave us a review, sharing what you like about the podcast, and share with others who would be interested in listening.